This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast. Today, we are back with you on another round of the Brokers Roundtable. Excited to dive into part three of commercial real estate investment sales. Part one ended up going a little bit longer than we had uh, we had anticipated. And then part two, we got cut off a little bit thanks to my wonderful and glorious internet connection. So we're bringing you part three. Today, we're going to be diving into convincing owners to sell. How do you actually land those listings, marketing those listings? How are you going to go about finding buyers for them? And then tips for negotiating and closing these transactions. It's going to be jam-packed. So we'll just kind of dive right in if you guys are good with it. Uh, we got Jesse and Chad here with us today. Adam is out on vacation skiing, so we all feel so bad for him at the moment. Uh, but Jesse, let's let's start it off with you, man. Um, since uh, you were tied up last time, you had some sort of event going on, I believe, that you were hosting. Uh, but talk to us about landing these listings. How do you? How do you? What's your pitch to a property owner? How do you get them to actually list a property with you and take the sale? Yeah, thanks, Ty. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay with the mic. Yep, we got you good. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so I was at uh, it was a Real Capital conference in uh, for um, basically real estate investors in Toronto, um, Canada, brought more broadly, um, but that's where I was at. Um, in terms of getting the initial uh, buyers, I mean, it, it really it's got to be multifaceted from our point of view. Um, we do a lot of outreach, um, and I think we'll talk about this today. But it's going to be existing relationships that we have developed. Um, you know, that's one source. Another source will be, especially in today's market, looking at pain points. Uh, so whether that's expired listings, you know, people that have gone through the selling process maybe with one or two agents before, um, that's usually uh, another kind of bucket. Um, and then there's going to be the net new, uh, and that's really kind of building your systems. And you got to really def define what type of product you're looking at selling. So if it's multi-res, you're going to look at uh, a geography and you're going to look at a unit count. If it's office, a certain type of office or industrial, uh, you're going to target something different. But, you know, it's a big question for, you know, for this type of uh, kind of beginning to build your kind of CRM database of, of buyers. So I kind of bucketed into, into those three, um, but you're happy to go into detail on them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny as a, you know, long standing commercial real estate broker, the, the running joke has always been, you never want to be the first guy. You want to be the second or the third listing agent. Cause those are the ones that ended up getting it sold. The first guy has to take, you know, it's, they're the pioneer. They get the arrows in their back from the seller uh, the seller doesn't want to change their list price. They don't want to share this. They don't want to concede on that. Uh, and then the second or third guy comes along. You're six or 12 months into it, and they actually decide, okay, I think we should probably sell. Yeah, so that's not a bad tactic. Yeah, especially today, like more than ever because of a protracted close cycle, just given what's transpired over the last three to four years, the, the market itself, uh, all of that kind of adds up to, you know, sometimes it does take a, a couple agents before, you know, you have the the final sale. And, and I, you know, we've talked about this before. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the efficacy of the first agent, but the dealer or the uh, seller sometimes just needs a little bit of uh, fatigue. Yeah. Have you, have you, are you seeing that right now? Are you seeing a lot of seller fatigue out there with, with trying to get their properties moved? Yeah. And, and it comes in different shapes and sizes in, in terms of what the seller is able to do. And what I mean by that is sometimes you'll have sellers that are, you know, they're frustrated and they take it off the market and they might be capitalized in a way that they can do that. Others, they get frustrated, but they, they really need to sell. So, you know, they might try to switch up brokers, um, you know, they might try to do other things, but ultimately if they need to sell, they still have to put the property out there. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that right now. It's, um, you know, it's just a function of the environment, the economic environment we're in. Chad, what about you, man? What's what's kind of your approach in, in landing these uh, these sales clients? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would agree with everything Jesse said there. I, I, 
I would add that it often comes down to a client's motivation. If a client's very motivated to sell for whatever reason, perhaps they're on the cusp of going into receivership, perhaps there's a larger property they want to buy, perhaps they're just bull, they're bearish on the future. If they're motivated, they'll be realistic on their sale price. If they're not motivated, if they just want to see what they can get in an open market, then they'll typically start higher. That's that's the challenge we've been dealing with over the last two years is that bid ask spread between what a buyer wants to pay and what a seller wants to get. It's at an all time high right now. And that's driven largely by interest rates, fear of what's going to happen in the economy. But to the original question, how, how to get listings, and I say this somewhat facetiously, but just give the highest price. If you're an agent and you want to get a listing, just give the highest price. And that's often what actually happens on why the first agent in there doesn't sell it is because the uh, seller lists it with the person that gives them the highest price in there. In my mind, that's terrible business. It's the worst thing you could do as a broker because now you're working for free. You're tarnishing your reputation in the market that you're taking on overpriced listings. So it's reasonable to say that if a, if a guy has a really overpriced listing, there's chances are he has other overpriced listings. And again, you're just wasting your time. What some people might say, and I've heard this strategy as well, is they'll say, take on the listing at whatever price you have to and slowly start wearing the seller down by trying to get price reductions over time. So conversation might be like, sure, we'll list it for $10 million, but if we're not getting any activity in the first two months, let's pre-agree that we'll lower it to $9 million or whatever it is, and they'll have some built-in conversation to try and lower it. It's difficult because that's quite often what agents get painted into a corner on is the owner will say, I want $10 million for this. So what's your price? What do you recommend on it? And if an agent comes in and says, listen, I've done all this due diligence. I've, I've surveyed the entire market. I've done an underwriting on this. I think the market for this is $9 million. But another agent comes in and says, yeah, I'll take it on for $10 million. That's, we've probably all been on the other side of this where the agent that takes it for $10 million. So I, I think that there are things that you can do to position yourself for, to not have to take on those overpriced listings. I'm not a fan of that personally. I, I try to price things as, as close to what I think fair market value is. But it, we also play in a playground where no two assets are really the same. And it is difficult to price an asset sometimes because we don't know. There's so many variables that go into it. So there might be a buyer out there that is willing to pay a premium that we hadn't thought about because we were trying to look at it what a general buyer would say. So it's it's a challenge. Coming up with a fair market value for something as complex as a commercial or industrial real estate investment is very, very challenging. Let's 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 dive into that a little bit further because that is one of the biggest frustrations that I've ever had as a commercial real estate broker. There was a property that is uh, right down the street from my office, and this was this is probably two years ago. And, you know, of course, obviously, I was brought in to be one of the the brokers in the pitch, and I knew the market better than anybody else. I told him this building will sell for a million five. That is exactly what this will go for based on all of these comps. They're like, yeah, we really want a million eight, and I kind of told him I was like, look, I mean, I, I we can list it at a million eight. I'm telling you, it's going to sell at a million five. So as long as you guys are willing to, you know, drop the price or at least entertain offers over a million four fifty or a million four, you know, let's counter those. Uh, let's let's have the conversation. They ended up listing it with a tenant rep broker, which blew my mind. This guy, all he does is represent tenants for and leasing. Um, who I guess came in and said, Yeah, I'll list it for a million eight, whatever. Well, guess what it sold for three months later? A million five. five. And it like it infuriated me because, you know, I pretty much brought in all of the data, all of the information backing that up. They said, no, we want to list it for a million eight and they still sold it for a million five. So, I mean, there's there's two trains of thought, right? It's the I'm going to hold steady to my guns. I'm going to tell you what it's worth. But then you, you might lose out on the listing and lose out on the opportunity altogether so how do you reconcile the, okay, well, we'll list it for a million eight, even though I know it's not worth that, and maintain your reputation as a broker? I mean, Chad, we'll, we'll start off with you on that one. Yeah, that's a, it's a fascinating topic. I, I think that there's a lot of ways that you can approach it. 
you can say, sure, I'll take that on for a million eight. But again, I'm, my data holds true. I, I would lean more towards the side of the best way to combat that scenario is to have a lot of coals, a lot of coals, irons in the fire. Uh, if you have a lot of irons in the fire, any one that gets pulled out isn't going to materially impact your business. But if you're a new agent, and this is where new agents struggle the most, they might only have that one client that they're talking to or potential client. And if that client says a million eight's the price, you, there might be a lot of trepidation to say, no, it has to be a million five. I know my stuff. So th that agent might be tempted. However, if there's a an agent that was had a lot going on and perhaps they'd had a number of deals in various stages and they were working on new listings, that one individual listing wouldn't be as impactful. So it, you could hold to your guns. So I think that's one of the biggest things is it, you can't be dependent on any one deal because that's, that's just a recipe for frustration and failure in our business. I, I would, I, what I try to do, and, and I'm sure I've been guilty of taking on pro properties that are overlisted at overpriced as well, but it's just a candid conversation with the owner is here's all the data, everything that I have on, on the, on the market, everything that's going on. If you disagree with anything on here and you can show me why this property is worth one eight, I'm all ears, but a prudent buyer is going to go through this exact same exercise. So if a prudent buyer is going to do this, and we're assuming that's going to be a smart buyer that comes to buy this by you pricing it higher, we're basically looking for that dumb money. And I don't know too many guys uh, that are dumb money that are in a position to buy a $1.8 million building. So I think we really need to be a realistic here. Otherwise, it's just going to sit on the market and you can become stigmatized. People could wonder why it's been on the market so long. There's a lot of reasons why fishing for a higher price is not good sound business. And sometimes that's a hard conversation to have. And again, that goes back to how much you have on your plate. If that's the only thing you're working on, that can be a really tough conversation to have because you might just get uh, shunned out of the room. You might just say, get out of here. Uh, whereas if you've got a lot of things on the go, it, it's a lot easier to have that conversation. So I I, I think that that's really the, the best way to approach it is have enough going on that no one deal is, is going to end your end your year, ruin your year, and be prepared to have very candid conversations. Unco we get paid for having uncomfortable conversations. We're not just order takers where someone puts in an order like we're a waiter and we type it into the kitchen, pick up the food and deliver. We're bringing a lot more value. And sometimes that just means having an uncomfortable, candid conversation. Yeah, I mean, that's that's always the approach that I've had is, look, I've got too much going on. I don't want to market your property for free and get nothing out of it because I know I'm not going to sell it at that price. And, you know, especially now being on the buy side of these things, I know exactly how investors think of brokers that overprice things. And it is, uh, you know, and just talking to my investor buddies, I mean, there are brokers that have a reputation in the market for always overpricing things. And I'll tell you, like, investors will talk about it in their circles and never make offers on those properties. Anything that that broker touches, they're like, yeah, it's probably overpriced by at least 20%. We're not even going to bother, you know, submitting an offer. And, you know, it's it's good now to have that experience from, you know, coming from the broker side of the table to now the investor side of the table of knowing like, okay, well, I'm going to tell the seller this. Hey, by the way, you know, you could overprice it, but brokers that have a reputation for overpricing – get fewer offers because people won't even think that you're worth negotiating with because it just seems so unrealistic. Jesse, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with everything Chad just said. So there's, I mean, there's really to me, three things you could do. You could agree to the seller's price. You could not take the listing and then you could, you know, come up with some sort of uh, hybrid or a solution. So for me, we just dealt with this and it kind of ties back into having sometimes a second or third agent uh, to, to get the sale. We had something that had stayed on the market for a while. Uh, the pricing was very high. They dropped the pricing. And we actually, this was a little bit different in the sense that we said, listen, we won't take the listing unless it's uh, this price per square foot. And, and the total price, I think, was just, just shy of $10 million. But the owner didn't want to deal with, like, he didn't like the pricing. And we said, these are the comps. Um, now, if there's nothing worse than taking on a listing that you know you can't sell because then you're you you're right you do win it but then you stockpile these very frustrating time-consuming listings 
So what I like to do is, you know, depending on the state or province, um, it might be a little bit different in terms of how you how common this is. But we'll tell the buyer, uh, we'll say, okay, listen, like in this case, we'll guidance. We'll put guidance. So if he says ten million, we'll tell the market. They call us. We'll guide them at ten million. But we're going to go on un, unpriced. We're going to go to the market unpriced, which is not uncommon in commercial real estate. So for us, we're up on all of the normal websites. We're marketing it with basically pricing contact agents um, if we're not doing a bid or anything and then they call me and then i can have a more frank conversation with the agent on the other side i can say listen you know put an offer in if they're if they say in this example that the, the buyer wants 10 i think it's really around nine you know guy comes and says well you know 90 9.2 or will 8.8 move the needle at least there i can have a conversation and, and do what a broker is supposed to do be able to get some sort of zone between the buyer and the uh, and the seller uh, that's agreed upon because you just might have a, a buyer that says I will not put this price you know below this price I will not market it like that and so you have to kind of be the the conduit uh, between the, the potential buyers out there and and your cl- seller client yeah I like that approach because you you get the listing you're not going to get the reputation of having something that's overpriced. You can have a frank conversation with with the group that's calling in. And it, it at least gives you an opportunity to start building rapport with a potential buyer, right? Because they wouldn't be calling you if they weren't interested in that property, right? And any also, sophisticated yeah. investor is probably going to have an idea of what the pricing is going to be. Yeah. And then you actually have real date, uh, data that you go to your, you say you have, you got three offers and, and say they all are following around, you know, like your example before, they're all following around that 1.5. That's evidence for you to take back in a non-patronizing, non-argumentative way with your seller, right? This is these are just the facts. Yeah. Hey, the market, the market is speaking. Let's listen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So once you've gotten the, you know, you've convinced the seller. Hopefully, you told them it's worth a million five, and they're like, you know what? Let's list it at a million five. I like you. How do you go about marketing that? And, and I'm not necessarily talking about like, let's put together a, a flyer and let's send out the email blast. I mean, let's let's talk about like the next level commercial real estate broker stuff, the things that we're doing to actually earn our commissions. What is your like, you know, order of operations, your attack strategy once you get a, a property listed that you know, this is a great deal. This is a price that's going to sell. Uh, Jesse, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So uh, for me, it really depends on what type of uh, uh, product you're selling. Not so much of like the asset class, but more so of if it's going to be an investor that's buying, if it's going to be a, a user play. So, for instance, like when we get when we get you know real estate that we know is likely going to be a user as opposed to an investor, then for us the outreach to those users is is crucial. So you know if we know that there's kind of this property, it's it's probably something that would be, you know, maybe education users or gym users. Like it really lends itself to a certain type of group. Then we'll start the direct outreach and basically be contacting users saying, listen, you know, I know you have these different locations and those might be ones that have never purchased before. They might lease, um, but you know that they have decent covenant. Would you be interested in purchasing? And then you start that active outreach. On the other side, when it's investors, that's usually where we we work kind of the lists that we've cultivated over the last, you know, it's not sexy. It's it's uh, outreach that you've done, lists that you've built and qualified and kind of pepper those guys and and see if there's anything creative that that you could do on that end. Those are usually the two kind of ways I look at that uh, investors or actual operators. Chad, what about you? Speaking specifically on the industrial side, one thing that I'd really stress is that a broker pro ask a bunch of probing questions at the beginning, even before making a pitch, because different owners are going to have different expectations and they're going to have different ways that they want things done. And a really simple example of that is an owner that doesn't want wide exposure. They might not want the property listed on a website. They might not want to sign out front. They might just want a quiet close so they don't disrupt the tenants. They don't want the tenants even knowing it's for sale. You'd be surprised how many times I've actually dealt with that scenario. And it's, if it's an owner that's had the property for 20 years and they've had the same tenants in there, they've probably built a bond and a relationship with those tenants. And to just 
tell them that they're selling it and then tenants will get all worried and they might start looking for other space uh, as a result. But there's, there's a lot of valid reasons on why an owner might not want to have an expansive marketing plan. So like, that's one of the things that, that I really try to do at the beginning is ask questions. Like, what, what are your objectives? What are you, what are you looking for on this? How do you want this handled? And it really becomes almost a strategy session as almost like a partnership. Like we're, let's come up with a price together. Uh, like instead of you saying it's worth one eight, I'm saying it's worth one five. Let's arrive at a price together on this, but also how do you want this marketed? What, what do you want included in that? Uh, and if it is an owner that just says, I want a quick sale, I don't want my tenants to know, I don't want this marketed to Jesse's point, just go out to a, a select group of clients that you know are interested in that type of property and present it to them with a with a package probably under an NDA or CA, a uh, very, very strict one, and keep it very low-key. Conversely, you might find an owner that says, I want every single buyer in the market to know about this, including out-of-town buyers and international buyers. And at that point, you're going to have to take on a much more expansive and aggressive approach. But that's that's driven by the client. That's not driven by us. That's what, what does the client want? And quite often that, that can be what wins or loses business beyond just the price. I still think the easiest way to get a listing is to just be the highest priced broker because uh, that, that money talks and a lot of people unfortunately just listen to it. I, it's not the right way, but it's the easiest way. But if you and I guess I would say, like, if you were to, if you're in a, so you own property, Tyler, if you're in the shoes of selling a property, one broker comes in and says, yeah, I can get you one eight for this all day and very little data, not a whole lot going on. They don't ask questions about what you're looking for. They don't uh, dive deep into it. Whereas another agent comes forward, has all this data, comes fully prepared, asks a bunch of questions. Like, what are your goals? What are your objectives? What are you trying to hope to get on this? And then says one five. If, if there is a way to compete on price so that you didn't have to uh, list it at 1.8, but you're that much more prepared and you're asking those questions and you're as resonating with the seller, I mean, I, I think you're giving yourself the best chance of getting the listing at that 1.5, assuming that he's not just driven by the price to get 1.8, which in that point, <laughs> there's, I, you either take it at 1.8 or, or I don't know what you can do. Yeah, I mean, I've always kind of been of the mindset that if somebody's not even willing to listen to you as the expert and the data, they're probably not worth working with, right? Mm-hmm. This isn't going to be the only hurdle that that happens in this entire thing, right? They're either not going to share documents on time, they're not going to show up to closing, you know, they just take it in a very different way. It's not as professional as I would prefer it to be. So I would completely agree with that. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, cold calling, building up those lists, that's the thing about commercial real estate. That's why everybody says it takes three to five years. Because once you're five years into this business, you've talked to how many dozens, if not hundreds of potential buyers. If you've done a good job, you've kept a list of all of them with all of their phone numbers. Maybe you've even got them you know, saved in your cell phone under a buyer. So you can just go through and make all of those phone calls right there. Uh, it makes it so much easier. You know, I mean, my, my team now, like, Whenever an industrial deal pops up, we make five phone calls and chances are pretty good. We're going to have a contract pending from one of those five phone calls because we just know over the last 10 years, we've curated this list of potential people that would be interested in that type of product. Makes your life a lot easier. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. All right. Let's let's talk about uh, you know negotiating strategies for working on these investments and and tips for actually getting them closed because... Man, there are some personalities when it comes to selling commercial real estate. Uh, there are some egos involved, and there's a lot of uh, hand holding throughout the process, no matter how sophisticated a group is. So, uh, you know, what are what are some tips for negotiating these deals um, to make sure that you can at least get them under contract, right? Because I mean, I've seen some crazy things pop up. Like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were working on a deal. The, the seller didn't want to share any financials. He thought that his pro forma was good enough. Okay, well, there's a couple of different ways that we can handle this, right? We can negotiate a, uh, a, a purchase price that includes the risk that we're taking by you are not providing financials, or we've got to get you to provide the financials. So what, uh, what are some uh, interesting approaches you guys have had? And Chad, we'll start it off with you. Yeah, one thing I'd say is that, and, and this maybe is not 
conventional brokerage advice, but I, sometimes we run the risk of overselling and thinking that we need to push and force deals along. And quite often we do need to nudge things forward and we, and what we do and how we interact with various parties does have a profound impact, but I've never once in my career had to hard sell somebody. I've never had to use like a car salesman tactic. Uh, like I don't know if you guys have ever driven a, or if, gone to look at a car recently. I, I've actually had two salesmen say this to me. Uh, what do we need to do right now to get you uh, to buy this car today? Two different salesmen at two different dealerships that say that. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's just like a corny, high pressure sales tactic that I've never used sales tactics. Uh, if anything, I think the beauty of commercial real estate, especially in the investment space, is it's very logical. An investor wants X. They want this return. They're going to value the building accordingly. Here's the price. And you can usually share that information. So if a buyer comes and says, I know you guys are asking 10 million. I've run a full analysis on this and I'm valuing it at 8 million. And here's why. That's a pretty compelling argument to say to the seller. This is why he's valuing at 8 million. I don't need to use some cheesy sales tactic to try and twist his arm to take that 8 million. This is, this is sound reasoning. And I think if you couple that with the approach that you're taking it out to numerous people, uh, because I, I think there is a risk in, in having a deal st- uh, go into stalemate. If it's just one buyer that you take it to seller says he wants to sell, you just take it to one buyer that, that could be challenging. It can work, of course, and I'm sure it's done regularly, but that can be challenging. If you've taken it to 30 buyers and a, one offer comes in at 8 million, you can say, I've given thir- 29 other people the same opportunity to buy this and no one else has wanted to put forward an offer. So that's a, that's a data point right there. But then you add in that this one buyer has written an offer. Here's all the reasons on why he's done it. It's up to you. Like this, this is just all I can do is make sure that I've put this in front of as many willing, ready, and able buyers as I possibly can. And here's the price that came in. So that's long, long story short. I, I I would recommend against trying to be high pressure, and instead rely on the data. The data is all there. There's it, there's very little speculation that goes into it. An investor will just say, "Here's how I'm evaluating this." And if you couple that by saying, "I've taken it out to all these other buyers." Here's the feedback that I've gotten on why they're not interested or why they're not going to proceed. I think that that, that, that speaks for itself anything more than me giving a cheesy line like, what, are you, what do you need to do to sell your building today? I, just, I don't think it's very effective. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I mean, that's what I love about commercial real estate is you don't have to have any of that that those corny salesman approaches, because they don't work, in my opinion. Nobody's going to make a $5 million decision just because you said, hey, how can I get this deal done today? Right, it doesn't work like that. I mean, it's just, there's so many moving cogs in the machine that it, even if they said, you know what, here's what we need to do, chances are you still have 99% of the deal you got to jump over to, to get it done. Um, you know, the one thing that I always tell my brokers is you are the only one in this deal that is going to get this done, and you need to act like that. Because that's one thing that I unfortunately learned in my many years of brokerage is that for whatever reason – Every single other party in this transaction doesn't want to get this deal done for for whatever reason. The buyer doesn't actually want to buy. The seller doesn't actually want to sell. The attorneys, they want to blow this thing up at every possible opportunity and redline the hell out of a piece of paper until it becomes a rainbow. I mean, they want nobody actually wants this transaction to happen. So you've got to have that in, in your that mindset as a commercial real estate broker. If I'm the only one that's going to push this forward, what do I need to do today? to keep it on track. Uh, Jesse, what about you, man? Yeah, I think like even back to the, the conversation before, it's like you're greasing the wheels. Like you have to keep the lubrication of the deal continuing. I think it's not really us, like to ch- I agree with Chad, it's, it's not really us selling in the conventional sense, but selling the deal itself to the parties involved and continuing to have it move in the right direction. So the way I approach this is right from the outset, you need to be, To me, I I need to be clear what the expectations are. And what I like to do is have, you know, the data room that you that the buyer understands the deal so that we don't get in a situation, especially today. Again, talking about the market where you start getting retrading. Oh, I didn't know about this or this environmental report showed this. It's like, no, no, no. We had all this information up front. 
so that everybody's on the same page. So I think that's a big component of it, just making sure that the expectations are set right from the get go so that th when these things come up, you can, you know, you can work through them. Um, but yeah, I think you know, a big part of our job is not traditional type of selling, like, you know, you buy this for this amount of money and they're going to, you know, all of a sudden come to an epiphany that, that, you know, I should spend two two million dollars more. It's like Chad said, they're going to do their valuation. And you know what? It's also the reason that, that when people don't know our industry, they're kind of confused that we don't always go with the highest price, say in a bid situation. If I go to my client and say, hey, this guy, he's got the highest price, but he's been known to kind of retrade, uh, known not to be able to close on certain deals. Like that's another part of us as, you know, quotation sellers. Uh, if we're selling a deal to our, our, our clients, we're de-risking it. So it's not necessarily the highest price is the best for, for them in, in every circumstance. Yeah, I mean, I think more than anything, we're creative problem solvers, right? We're here to give everybody as many potential options uh, as we possibly can. You know, and, and going back to Chad's point earlier, it's, it's all about the questions that you ask. If you don't ask the questions, you don't know what problem you actually need to solve, right? And maybe I could have done a better job on that $1.5, $1.8 million deal of asking better questions, right? I mean, I was just running through, uh, you know, what's a possible scenario we could have done here? Well, why is $1.8 million important? important to you? Why is that more important to you than 1.5? Uh, well, Tyler, you know, I need to, I, I'm going to retire after this. This is my retirement. And $1.8 million makes me feel really comfortable having that in the bank. Okay. So you're not planning on spending this money on anything. This is going to last you the rest of your life. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about seller financing. If you sell it for 1.5 million, you carry a $500,000 note. You walk away with a million dollars in cash. You have $500,000 at you know, five, six percent interest for five years, you're going to make a pretty decent chunk of money back, right? Or maybe you do it for 10 years, right? And they hold it for the entire time. And, you know, I, I can't run the math of what, you know, interest rates would be and how much cash you'd actually bring in over that five, you know, 10 year period. But you kind of understand my point of like, if that was the problem, I could have solved it in a different way that would have gotten the $1.5 million price would have gotten me the sale, would have gotten the seller the $1.8 million total that they needed to feel comfortable with retiring or whatever it was. And uh, it all comes down to asking the right questions. So who knows? Maybe, just I, maybe one, I just didn't ask the question, right ones. Yeah. One other question you can ask, and I've asked this as well, is would you buy this property today for $1.8 Oh, so they're always going to say no. Yeah. Of course they're going to say no. And so the logical thing is, well, why would we expect someone else to? Like it's it, investors at this level are smart. They're sophisticated investors. Uh, there's not a lot of dumb guys walking around with a million eight burning a hole in their pocket. They're doing the exact same analysis. So the questions, uh, the questions themselves can be very powerful. Oh man, I love that one. Would you buy this property today for that price? <laughs> You'll, you're almost never going to get a yes. Never. never. And if you do, you might tell yourself out of a sale. They might say, you know what? Yeah, actually, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got oh, I've gotten uh, something to the effect of like, but they're not me. It's like, oh, you're you're the genius investor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you 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 knew exactly what you were doing. You just happened to buy it 15 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> before real estate took off. Uh, that's great. Well, guys, it's been a uh, a great part three. Appreciate you all jumping on and doing this with us. Um, thank you all in the audience for joining us. Uh, don't forget to tune in every other Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, to dive into more commercial real estate brokerage with us. If you have any questions specifically that you want us to be diving into, feel free to drop those in the, uh, in the comment section on YouTube, and uh, we'll be sure to bring them up. But uh, otherwise, we'll see you guys next time. So this episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com.